Good morning. There we go. Uh, this morning, before we take of uh, the communion together, I want to read um, some scripture and then show, show you something that I thought was uh, very appropriate. If you would bring up Luke chapter 23, verses 32 and 33, and then I'll skip down to uh, 20, 39 through 43. <clears throat> it says, there were also two criminals led out with Jesus to be put to death. When they came to a place called the Skull, the soldiers crucified Jesus and the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And then go down to 39. One of the criminals on a cross began to shout insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Then save yourself and us. But the other criminal stopped him and said, you should fear God. You are getting the same punishment he is. We are punished justly getting what we deserve for what we did, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. And I saw something the other day that was uh, very fitting to go along with that. John, you want to go ahead and, and bring that up? And you may have seen this before, but I really liked what they said here. Three men, three crosses, one hill. One man cursed, one man prayed, one man promised. One died condemned, one died forgiven, one died innocent. One died in sin, one died to sin, one died for sin. One was held by death, one was released by death, one conquered death. One lost life, one gained life, and one was life. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, and praise God we have eternal life. Uh, would you read the last stanza there uh, with me together? Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice, and praise God we have eternal life. Would you bow with me as we give thanks for the bread? Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for blessing us. God, we especially want to thank you for your plan, for your love, for Christ's love, that even on the cross, God, all that he went through, even on the cross before his death, he was love, full of love, always has been love, always will be love. God, thank you for his forgiving heart. God, thank you for his desire to serve, to serve you. God, we especially thank you for his willingness to die for us, to die innocently for the guilty. God, thank you for the bread, what it represents, his body that was beaten, um, that was bruised, and that was put up on that cross. God, I pray that you would bless it as we partake of it. God, thank you again for what it means. And we pray these things through your son's name. Amen. give thanks for the cup. Mighty Heavenly Father, God, we again I want to thank you. God, thank you for your plan. Uh, God, it's hard to imagine what, um, what Christ felt uh, as he was up there. God, I thank you for uh, the blood. We know that there's life in the blood, and we thank you for the life that, the eternal life that we will have because of of Christ's blood that he shed for us. God, I thank you that we can be together, that you want us to be reminded uh, each week to recommit to you, to remember Christ's sacrifice, and to remember what his body and what this blood, what his blood represents, and this cup that represents the blood that was shed. God, thank you for it. Again, thank you for your love and Christ's love. In his name I pray, amen. And now is the time we usually take to um, 
give back, say, say thank you in another way. And before we, before we do that, um, I'll give thanks for that as well. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you uh, for another opportunity to be together. God, I thank you for all the many blessings that you give us each and every day, especially for the spiritual blessings that we have. God, you also bless us uh, physically. God, I thank you for the jobs that we have, uh, the homes that we have, our family, friends. God, I want to especially thank you for uh, last week we gave to the uh, children's homes. God, I want to say thank you for, for all the children throughout the world. God, I thank you for the people who work with them at the children's homes. Um, God, I pray that you would give them patience, uh, understanding as they work with children. God, we thank you for that. Thank you uh, for blessing us so that we can help bless them. God, I also want to thank you for all those who work with the Gospel Chariot. God, I thank you for brothers and sisters all throughout the world and those who work with the lost. Um, God, I especially want to thank you for those in, in Africa and uh, with the Gospel Chariot. God, I thank you for Mike Napier, for his desire. God, I pray that you continue to, to be with that work. God, I pray that your uh, word will spread like wildfire, uh, continue to spread through Africa. God, I thank you again for blessing us to help them. God, again, I thank you. Um, God, I thank you for the opportunity to give. I just pray that we give joyfully and that you would bless those who, uh, who make use of, of uh, what we give today. God, again, thank you for loving us. In his name I pray. Amen. Well, if you would stand with me, we'll sing uh, this song, and then we'll dismiss the kids. And then, yeah, go ahead and stand, uh, if you would, please. I don't want to. I don't want to impose. We'll sing this song. We'll dismiss the kids. We'll sing another song, and Vernon will come up and give the lesson. These are the days of Elijah.
Thank you for that, Stephen. And thank you for being here today. Uh, you honor God by being here today. You bless the church by being here today. So I just want to say thank you each time we assemble for that. For those who couldn't be here but join us on Facebook, thank you for that. Our prayers you're able to join us sometime soon. It's hard for me to believe this is August already. It, it seems every year goes faster, but it's August of 2023. And in my, in my mind, that's just crazy how fast uh, life continues to fly by. But this being a new month, we're looking at a new attribute of God. Our goal this year has been to, to know God better. And we've been looking at many of the different attributes of God, striving to grow in our knowledge of Him and grow closer to Him. This month, the attribute is holiness. Our God is a holy God. As always, in every lesson, we're trying to see what the Bible says about these things. And our base scripture for this particular month is 1 Samuel 2.2. We read it earlier. We'll look at it again. No one is holy like the Lord. There's no one besides you. There's no rock like our God. We chose that verse because it seems like one of the main points of God's holiness is that there is no one else like our God. There's no other God like our God. Whether we're talking about God being our Heavenly Father or the fact that He is the very essence of love, no one loves us perfectly like God does. Or if we're talking about that God is the Almighty, He is the one and only Almighty, all-powerful God. We have talked about that he is a just God who is faithful to keep his promises, who loves to show mercy. But because God is holy, he does all those things perfectly. This past month, we looked at what the Bible said about God being a jealous God, that he is jealous or passionate about our relationship with him, about who or what sits on the throne of our hearts, who or what has priority in our lives because the priorities we have affects our relationship with Him. And nothing is more important than that to God. I think this attribute may be the best attribute of all of them that we study as far as describing God. God is holy because this attribute perfects every other one of them. God's holiness is more than just his perfection or sinless purity, God is perfectly pure. There is no darkness in him. And being pure without sin is a big, big piece of what it means to be holy. But it's more than that. It's the very essence of his otherness, his transcendence, his uniqueness, his rightful place as God. Only God deserves the throne or to have first importance in our lives. God's holiness embodies the awesomeness of who he is. It causes us to be in awe. We're going to talk about that. It causes us to be in wonder about who he is. And as we grow to understand a little bit more of his majesty, that awe grows. He is above all, beyond all, before all. God is holy. And as I said before, and you're going to hear me say, and I'm going, to, I'm going to do my best to repeat this for as long as I'm able to preach or teach. What we're trying to do is see what the Bible says about it. Because that's what matters. You think this, I think this, you have an opinion, I have an opinion. There's all kinds of teachings that exist. But what matters is what does the Bible say? And are we trusting God and obeying what he says? We've been studying the book of Revelation for a few weeks out here in, in uh, our auditorium class. And I thought it was going to work out perfectly, the timing of it. But we're not, Chuck's a lot slower than I am, so we're not quite, not quite there yet. Revelation chapter 15, we'll look at a few verses from there. I'm kidding. I love your class. Revelation chapter 15, what is stated here is really appropriate to what we're studying about. John wrote in verses 2 through 4. I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, 
and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord, God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. God alone is holy, and everyone will bow before him someday. This bowing before God directly relates to this idea of being holy. The holiness of God creates worship, creates wonder. The holiness of God may be difficult for us to fully grasp and fully understand or fully explain because I think it's one of his attributes that we cannot possess inherently on our own. We, we are created in God's image, and we can share many of his attributes to certain degrees, right? Love, mercy, faithfulness. We share them, and God calls us to share them. But some of his attributes, like omnipotence, we're not sharing that one. Omnipresent, everywhere all the time at the same time. Omniscient, knowing everything. Some of us may struggle with thinking that, but it's not true, right? Some of his attributes we don't share inherently. A lot like that, or at least similar to that, is holiness. Yes, we are set apart, and if you look at the word holy for that definition, we are holy, set apart by God. But this is something that we will not possess on our own. We only become holy, truly holy, in relationship to Jesus. It is an imputed holiness that God bestows on us. Only in Christ do we become the righteousness of God, the Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians 5. One of my favorite things about sharing communion each week together with the body is that constant, consistent reminder when we partake of the cup that the blood of Jesus covers me, cleanses me, and God sees holiness when he looks at this sin-stained soul. Me, a sinner, he sees the righteousness of Jesus because I've been clothed in Christ. I stand amazed, I stand in awe of God and his gospel our righteousness, our holiness is a gift from God that we don't possess on our own, but God does. God is holy. The phrase holy, holy, holy is found only two times in the Bible. Once in the Old Testament, once in the New Testament. Once in Isaiah and once in Revelation. John. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 4, what John said with this statement. Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 and then 8 through 11. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under the wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him, who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. In the Old Testament, we see very similar type language. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne. 
and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they flew. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I'm ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The angels in the presence of God crying, Holy, 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 covered their faces. Covered their feet. Showing reverence and awe for God and His holiness. Isaiah, a prophet, a righteous man. His reaction to seeing God's holiness was to be horribly aware of his own sinfulness and despair for his life. This type of reaction seems to be consistent throughout Scripture. A, a very a similar reaction, a real common story that most everybody here knows is when Moses came to the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3, I'm sure you remember the event, but it says, starting in verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Don't come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals for you're standing on holy ground. I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Bible tells us that God's glory is so brilliant, so bright, it's brighter than the sun. And every one of us recognize and realize we don't stare at the sun. God's glory is more glorious and more powerful than in our human ability to face. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 96, verses 4 through 9, Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. The gods of other nations are mere idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty surround him. Strength and beauty fill his sanctuary. O nations of the world, recognize the Lord. Recognize that the Lord is glorious and strong. Give to the Lord the glory he deserves. Bring your offerings and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in his holy splendor. Let all the earth tremble before him. The Bible teaches that there is a trembling, a fear of the Lord, a humbling experience associated with the holiness of God. The thought question I put in the bullet, or I had Tiff put in the bulletin this week, how has God's Holiness affected your life. Have you ever been in awe thinking of God's holiness? Blown away thinking of God's holiness. Have you ever felt a fearful reverence? Have you ever felt humbled recognizing your sinfulness in the presence of His holiness? It's obvious in Scripture that God's holiness created these things in the people that witnessed it. If the seraphim, the angels, exhibit that kind of reverence in the presence of the Lord, if Moses and Isaiah reacted that way to God's presence, what kind of profound reaction 
Should we? Stephen asked a question last week. He said, have we been broken by God's love for us? The idea was God's love is so amazing. God's love is so outrageous. He's jealous for our hearts because his love drives him to do outrageous things like the cross. But does that love break our hearts? The cross is a, is a horrifying thing. And what Jesus went through was a horrifying thing. And he did it because God loves you, me. But does his love for us break us, move us? In the same way or similar way, has the holiness of God ever created anything like what we read in God's word? Has a, God's holiness led us to that fear of the Lord, that incredible reverence, awe of who he is? Unlike created beings, God is perfect in power, perfect in knowledge, perfect in purity. He is ageless, tireless, faultless. He is beyond what we can fully comprehend as humans. The Bible says not even the faintest trace of evil exists in him. He's impeccably pure. Our language lacks the words necessary to justly describe God. And we're trying to get to know him better. And we're trying to study the attributes the Bible teaches us about him. But we can do it for the rest of our lives and still not gain everything we can gain about who he is. But we're striving. We're trying to learn to walk humbly with God. Knowing or seeing his holiness will help us walk holy with the Lord. The Bible teaches, blessed are the poor in spirit, Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What that means in my, in my understanding, what that means is, blessed are those who recognize, spiritually speaking, I am in desperate need. I am needy spiritually. I am poor spiritually. Blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble who recognize those things. Is it possible that in regard to experiencing this, this awe or not experiencing this awe, is it possible that it may be because we don't understand fully God's holiness? Or is it possible that we don't understand the ugliness of sin? I put it in my notes, I scratched it out, and I put it back in my notes, and I scratched it out. And right now it's scratched out, and I'm going to ignore the scratch out and tell you what I thought. Maybe not understanding the ugliness of sin is even more vital to what we're talking about. The reason I say that, let me tell you why I say that, because we live in a world that denies sin is ugly. In fact, I mean, they're aggressively teaching sin's not ugly, sin's Okay. And you don't have a right to say sin's ugly. Call it something else. Church family and those on Facebook listening, and this is actually, as I was preparing this and thinking about it, this is actually more to help us teach other people than it is teach you, because I think you understand this. But hopefully this equips you to teach some other people who don't understand this. These are the next few points. Salvation is only available to those who humble themselves. Salvation is only available to those who recognize God's holiness or recognize our sinfulness. Salvation is only available to those who confess their need for his forgiveness and surrender to him. Sin is a very ugly, very destructive, very deceptive, very controlling thing. When we accept the Lordship of Christ, we surrender our lives to Him. We turn away from sin or we repent. That's the word. That's the Bible word. 
We're buried with Christ in baptism and clothed in that righteousness, that holiness that he provides, that only he provides. But it only happens when we humble ourselves and submit to him, trust him. In Isaiah 57, Isaiah 57, verse 15, the Bible says, The high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one, says this, I live in the high and holy place with those spirits, with those whose spirits are contrite. That's broken. I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are broken, contrite, and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. There are people who teach that God's grace gives them permission to keep sinning. Ignoring scripture that tells us that without repentance, there is no salvation. They say they can't help it. It's just the way we are. We're human. We fail. That's why Jesus died for us. Well, Jesus did die for us because we sin and we can't save ourselves. But the Bible teaches he died for us so we live for him. The Bible teaches his grace is not permission to sin, but his grace teaches us not to. We'll look at several scriptures just so we understand, this is not what Vernon says. This is what the Bible says. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the, crowd, on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 says, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we receive the knowledge of truth, there's no longer any sacrifice that covers these sins. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 says, The grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed, God's grace teaches us to turn from godless living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. Jude wrote, in part of verse 4, ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago. I got to tell you, my heart is super heavy over the number of people who don't realize without repentance there's no salvation. There's no such thing as being a Christian and continuing to choose to participate in sin. There's no such thing as being a Christian and continuing to choose to participate in sin. Yes, we will mess up. Yes, we will fall short. But we are called as Christians to confess that sin and seek his forgiveness, not decide it's okay. Not claim that sin is okay. Our sin, my sin, put Jesus on the cross. It's not okay. It should break our hearts. God will mend our broken heart. God will heal our crushed spirit and rescue us from the penalty of sin. But he will not tell us it's okay to keep on sinning. Romans chapter 6, Paul wrote, should we keep on sinning? Verse 1 and 2. Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more, show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? 1 John chapter 1 verse 5 and 6 says, this is a message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. He's holy. So we're lying if we say we have fellowship with God. But go on living in spiritual darkness. We're not practicing the truth. Last time I'll say it today. What does the Bible say about these things? 
This stuff is, this stuff is obvious. It doesn't take any kind of scholar to figure out what the Bible says about the subject. We're deceiving ourselves and falling to the devil's lie when we think or teach. It's okay to keep sinning. Because we're covered by God's grace. I can walk in God's fellowship, His holiness, and walk in sin at the same time. I'm going to close the lesson the way Paul Harvey used to do it. I get by with that. We're, we're kind of probably a, I'm, I'm going to be really nice. We're kind of a middle-aged, older age group for the most part. So some of you really young people might not know who Paul Harvey is, but most of us do. Now for the rest of the story. We praise God for the gospel of Christ. If it were not for the gospel, the holiness of God would be mankind's greatest fear. For no sinner can stand in the presence of his blinding glory, but through the gospel, through faith, through the simple acts of faith, trusting Jesus, being buried with Christ in baptism, clothed in a righteousness that he provides, sealed or marked as his own people, holy. John's initial reaction to what we're talking about was the same as Isaiah and Moses and the angels. John's initial reaction, John chapter 1 verse 17 says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Don't be afraid. I'm the first in the laugh. I've conquered sin. I've conquered death. In the text from Isaiah, we see... When Isaiah confessed his sinfulness, God's angel took a burning coal and touched his lips and told him the guilt of his sin has been removed. The same, that same way you and I, who've obeyed the gospel, can live in his presence without fear. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence if we've had the hand of Christ put on us in the form of his righteousness if we've been clothed in the righteousness he provides. Remember that's something that he bestows on us. Jesus took our sinfulness on himself and took his righteousness and gave it to us. That's what took place at the cross. Can that possibly mean that we no longer need to revere or fear the Lord? Can that possibly mean that we no longer need to be in awe of him. I'd say, I'd say just the opposite. How ridiculous is it to think we can see God clearly and not be humbled or in awe of who he is and what he's done. One of the reasons we're trying to grow in our knowledge of him, one of the reasons we're trying to grow in our walk with him, to know him better, is for this very reason. Our God is our God is awesome, and we are drawn to God's goodness. Remember, he's holy. That means his goodness is perfect goodness. God is, God is love. Remember, he's holy, so his love is perfect love. We are drawn to God. Psalmist, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 42, As a deer pants for water, or I think it streams for water up there, so I long for God, I thirst for God, the living God, nothing, no one, and no thing satisfies like God does. The holiness of God should stir our hearts to continual praise and adoration and create a longing to be in his, his presence and a thanksgiving that he makes it possible for that to happen. Last point, God is worthy of our highest respect and God desires intimacy with you, with me. God desires that we walk in fellowship with him. This is God's will, God's desire, that we have intimacy with God. Despite our sins, despite the fact that we commit sins frequently, bouts of pride, shameful lapses in our faithfulness, 
He still welcomes us with open arms through the redemptive work of, of Jesus. God's desire for intimacy is something we should not skip or overlook or dismiss. Those who have placed their faith in Christ, those who have been buried with Christ and clothed in that righteousness, the Bible says God adopts, adds us to his church family. He adopts us, makes us his children, tells us that through his spirit we can cry out to him in a personal way, Father, Abba, Father. God desires this relationship. As Jim Dickey preached a few weeks ago, what does the Lord require of you? Micah 6, 8. This is what he requires of you. To do what's right. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with our God. If there is anybody here who has never been clothed in the righteousness that he provides, don't leave here outside that. That's the only place salvation is, is granted, in Jesus. If you've never trusted Jesus to be your Savior, to be your Lord, been buried with him in baptism, then you've never received that seal, that mark that identifies you as his own. If you need prayers in this, I confess to a few people. I'm going to go ahead and do this too. Um, my nephew, Levi. Rough, 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 rough life. Rough life. Messed up royally. I messed up royally. He went, he went forward at the church that he worships with a few weeks ago. And I am so proud of him for that. Because church family, you and I are sin. And we need to be confessing that need for forgiveness to God on a regular basis. You don't have to come up here to do it. But we need that practice in our life because we're called to walk humbly with our God. And we are sinners who need his forgiveness. Who are grateful for the price he paid to, to make it possible. If you need prayers, we're more than happy to pray with you. If you want to study anything about what I've talked about or any other subject, make it known. Let us know what you want to study about from the Bible. Because that's what we care about. What does the Bible say? And are we doing it? Let's stand. I think Stephen's got an invitation song. If you have a need of any kind, make it known. Thank you, Vernon, for your lesson. It takes a lot of time to prepare a lesson, and, and I, we need to show our appreciation to those who take the time to study and prepare lessons and, and speak to us. Have a thank you note from uh, Scott Hipsher. 
I would like to thank everyone for the food, cards, and well wishes, and especially for the prayers. I feel truly blessed uh, to be lifted up by so many people in prayer. Thank you, Scott Hipsher. Card turned in for Dan Leach. He will be having heart catheterization tomorrow. Uh, we want to remember him in our prayers, especially in the morning as he goes for, for that. Uh, <clears throat> want to remember uh, Brandy and, and, and her baby. As uh, far as I know, they're doing well. Uh, <clears throat> we have several that are traveling yet, uh, some returning home, some just leaving today on vacation. Want to remember them and their travels. Um, Shirley Doty, it's good to have her with us. She was recently in the hospital. Uh, <clears throat> want to remember Jacob Dasher's family at the passing of his grandmother. Uh, there are several on our prayer list, and we need to remember those in prayer. Uh, if you'll bow with me, uh, we'll have a word of prayer before we dismiss and go to our classes. Uh, where'd Stephen go? Do we? Oh. We don't have a closing. We do have a closing? No. Okay. Would you bow with me, please? Father God, we thank you for your word that you left for us, that we can know your will for us. We can know of your holiness. We can know what we need to do to be with you eternally. We ask this morning, Father, that your blessings, your strength, your courage be with those that we have mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> Give them the strength uh, to endure what must be. Heal those that, it, that it's in your plan. We know, Father, that uh, <clears throat> you are always with us, that you love us and that you, you care for us. We would ask that you would go to our classes with us. Uh, pray that those of us who will be uh, teaching will teach the truth. We'll leave room for opinions where, where there's room for opinions. But most importantly, Father, we pray that each one of us would know from your word why we believe what we believe. We would ask, Father, that, uh, that you would be with our congregation, with our elders, that you would bless them. <clears throat> it, it's not an easy task, but they're putting forth the work uh, for, your, for your church, for our congregation. We would ask for forgiveness of our sins, Father. This we ask in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. You are dismissed. No, you're not dismissed. Stick around for class.
Jesus. 